so I said there's one player that I think all of a sudden has changed the dynamics of whether or not uh, the ownership situation is playing into how the Washington Commanders are able to proceed as they please uh, in terms of a football operation or whether they are being held back by the ownership situation. And that came to a bit of a head when Ron Rivera was asked about that player this morning. That player is none other than Chase Young. I think the biggest thing more than anything else is we're continuing to finish that process. You know, and, and I mean, we're really, and Matt, we really are. I mean, it's one of those things that you've got to really think it through. You've got to be able to plan it out. Um, and with the uh, situation we're in right now, waiting on, like everybody else, to find out, you know, ownership, we, you know, we, we got to kind of drag our feet a little bit until we get to that point and find out, you know, do we have to find out from whoever the new ownership. But to be honest, if, if there's a new owner, we have to go to them. And find out, you know, what I'm saying it. So, I, I don't know at this point, um, but I know we are still talking about it uh, between Martin, Marty, uh, Eric, uh, uh, Rob Rogers, and myself. We've talked. We've had a couple of conversations. Uh, we like what we're seeing. His progress has gone very, very well. Uh, it continues to, to work out and, and just get stronger. And, and there's some real positive signs right now. That's all fine and dandy. There is no way they should have to be waiting on ownership to do this if it wasn't somehow outsized influenced by the owner. This should be a football decision. And Ron Rivera has said all along that football decisions are being made by football people. And that is why I think something that Michael Phillips has said on this show multiple times is extremely relevant here. Michael has always talked about how Chase is a Dan guy. And that, you know, when the ownership changes, like Chase Young's situation here could potentially change. And we've seen this over the course of time with Dan interfering in a variety of ways. Um, this one seemed a little less obvious up front and also less problematic because Chase Young was seen as the best prospect outside of Joe Burrow in that draft. There are people certainly that liked Herbert, people that liked other players that have turned out to be very good. But like Chase, Chase was the universal second pick and was the universal first pick until Joe Burrow emerged as the great and had the greatest season of probably any college quarterback ever. And I was like, ah, oh, we should probably take him number one. And that's worked out quite nicely for the Bengals. But I was like, oh, yeah, heck yeah. We won the Chase Young sweepstakes. We got to be number two. It's cool. Take him. Done. But remember, Chase is from here. Chase Young has been on Dan Snyder's radar since he was in high school. Uh, he is a gigantic star. He's the exact kind of guy, charismatic, outgoing, big personality, uh, you know, in theory, great for marketing and, and sales. He's the exact kind of guy that Dan Snyder has gravitated to over the years. And unfortunately, the other consistent theme with guys Dan Snyder has gravitated towards is haven't been as good at football as we thought they would be. And uh, injuries have played a part in that, certainly with Robert back in the day, although there's a lot more going on there. And certainly with Chase now, although, you know, it seems like there may be some more going on with that as well, with, you know, them being not psyched about him showing up for some workouts and, and, and various things over the course of time. So, to me, this is Ron Rivera saying, we don't want to re-sign Chase Young. And again, this is me. This is not me reporting. This is not me having talked to anybody. This is me looking at a, a big, giant board of red string that's actually only got a couple of pieces on it and and going, huh, these seem to connect. What connects to me is they haven't been committal on Chase Young's fifth-year option. They've said all the right things, but, and they know that, like, the best possible scenario is all of a sudden Chase Young's awesome and he get they signed him a new contract because he's the best defensive end in football. And that's what they drafted him to be. That's why you draft that dude second overall. Um, it's it's what his upside is, and and you know they re-sign him and and Chase Young, we he had a, a road bump hiccup, and now he resumes his Hall of Fame track. Sweet. That's not what they're saying though. They're saying you know hey we're still evaluating. Hey we got to see. And now Ron's punting it to other people. And to me that means they're gonna go whether it's him, whether it's Martin Mayhew, whoever it is that's gonna go to new ownership and be like, look, we know we drafted this guy second overall. We hoped it worked out. We got some concerns for whatever reason, health, production, 
whatever they may be, we don't think it's a good idea. And we just need you to sign off on it because the last guy loved this dude and we need permission. And we couldn't, like, he wouldn't let us decline the option. So we're hoping that that you will. To me, that's what that says. And by the way, it's the right football decision. I think Chase was solid at the end of last year. I think when he came back in those three games, he showed a lot. He reminded you what he can do against the run. I think the pass rush will come with another offseason, and assuming that he puts in the work and, and does all those things and the healing and the extra time and, and all that kind of stuff. Gets a full training camp, gets a full offseason. Assuming all of that stuff goes off without a hitch, I would assume Chase Young is back at a Pro Bowl caliber very soon. He just does freakish things that other people don't do. He has a nose for the ball. He makes big plays. He is a game changer when he's right, which is what we saw his rookie year. He got real lost in, in assignment discipline his second year. Then he got hurt, uh, and then and then we saw what we saw last year. But what he's done so far, and with the concerns around the in- injury that they've had, and whether you know now Ron Rivera said today, hey, he's got a clean bill of health. He went and saw Doctor Andrews again. All's good. But recovery from injury doesn't just mean a doctor looking at a scan. It's watching a guy move and being like, oh, yeah, he's back. He's the same guy. And especially one who is as freakish as Chase. And if you're talking about paying him this much money, you got to make sure he's up to that level. And with him, because he made a Pro Bowl as a rookie, his fifth-year option number is way higher than the average one. His is $17 million. If Chase were to sign a long-term deal, he'd be barely over that number. And I or maybe look if he goes out and has you know 18 sacks, then yeah, you're paying him 24 million a year or something. You know, if Duran just got 22, like he's going to beat that. But 17 is a huge number. And if he comes out and has an 11 or 12 sack season, he might need to take something closer to that range next year. And even again, if you if you AAV it out higher. The cap number next year, you could easily get to 17 or maybe even lower. So going ahead to commit yourself to that option doesn't seem like a wise financial like roster management decision. That doesn't mean you have to trade him. It does mean you should talk about it. It does mean that you should consider what your roster looks like moving forward with between Chase and Montez. It's a tough spot. And I think it's interesting that all of a sudden, Ron, after a whole offseason of we got everything we wanted, we're fine, ownership doesn't matter, I promise, you, why don't you guys believe me, ownership doesn't have anything to do with it, is all of a sudden, when asked about Chase Young and some of these other extensions, going, well, we got to see what ownership says, and we don't really have an owner right now. Chase wouldn't surprise me if it's a little more pointed than some of this other stuff, which is a little bit more in the details. Talk to Ben Standing about it. Coming up at 4 o'clock, uh, we will talk about either, uh, I don't know, Anthony, what should Anthony? What should we do next? we got two, two good options. We can either go down the Chase Montez trade rabbit hole, or they just did all the rule change approvals. Do you want to go through the rule changes next? I want to do that either next or at 345. So should we, is there meat on the Chase Montez bone that's that hasn't been chewed a thousand times already? You can hear me. Yeah! Uh, I think we should do uh, the Chase Young and Montez Sweat. All right, I know um, you have you have some thoughts on it. Don't yeah, you? and then do the the rule changes in uh, three forty five. All right, so that's what's coming up, the Hoffman Show. That's producing, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Anthony, you got you have thoughts on this this Chase Young Montez Sweat thing? I I don't know. I feel like I've talked about it ad nauseum. I feel like I've kind of said that I don't know. Maybe maybe. You have you're gonna say the same thing that I feel like I've said, and you'll say it better. Uh, but it's just like, yeah, the the math doesn't math. They eventually need are gonna need to move one, and uh, it'd be cool if they actually did that for once. Yeah, I mean, I understand that we do possibly have to move one, but would right now, or you know, ahead of the draft, or even possibly during the draft, would that be the time to actually decide to move on from one of these guys? And if we're not, you know going to give Chase Young his fifth year option and I'm in agreement with Ron and uh Martin uh Mayhew um about not necessarily giving it to him right now. I want to see him go out there and prove it, show that he's uh, actually, you know, worth um getting that uh fifth year option. 
Um, but if we're not going to, you know, give them that, should we possibly do what's in the best of, you know, our interest and try to sell him why he's, you know, still value at such a, you know, a high price, I think. Yeah, I, I think the trade value conversation around Young actually is pretty interesting, right? Because he's he's a bit unknown at the moment, right? You don't know how, exactly how good he is. Uh, obviously, any team taking him is going to want to see the medicals. Um, they're going to want to talk to James Andrews, his, his surgeon, uh, who's the best in the world, uh, or at least widely considered that. And Dr. Andrews has said, like, yeah, this, he's got a clean bill of health. So they're not going to find anything there. They're going to watch the tape of those three Cleveland games last year. They're going to compare it to what he looked like a couple years ago. They're going to compare it to what they had in terms of notes on him coming out of Ohio State. But I think the other big part of it is, like, contractually, what is he right now, and and what are you going to have to pay him? I wouldn't necessarily want to trade for Chase Young right now, in part because I know I only get one deal or one year of him unless I'm willing to take up that fifth-year option, unless I can tell the commanders, hey, pick up the option, or like trade, we'll trade uh, for him and we'll pick up the option. But I'm not looking to get a guy who's on an expiring contract in the NFL necessarily, um, because unlike the NBA where you see trades for expiring contracts all the time, you see that because there's bird rights. Like There's actual advantages to having a guy in-house. There's no real advantage for a team trading for Chase Young other than to be like, hey, man, we really like you, and we're going to pay you a bunch of money uh, next year. But, like, Chase Young's going to make $5.3 million this year. Uh, He's going to count $11 million against the cap, and then he's a free agent unless they pick up the option, and then he's uh, 17-4 next year, salary and 17-4 against the cap. So it's a weird thing where, like, I don't, you know, could you franchise him next year and then then work out a trade? Could you do the fifth-year option and then work out a trade and, you know, hope that he's awesome and then if you still want to trade him after the year, then you, you do that and, and let another team work out the deal like we've seen before with players that are franchised uh, and then traded? I think that's all on the table, but... He's got a weird trade value right now, both because of the injury and because his contract situation is 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 undesirable to acquire because there's very little lo- guarantees in terms of length, and you're not. It's not like you're reaping the benefits of getting him on a rookie deal where you get hopefully prime level production for many years to come. Yeah, but it's just one of those situations where, like, what if there is a team that's willing to, you know, take a chance on Chase Young? Well, then, well, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I feel as though there are teams that still, you know, see and may possibly value Chase as that, you know, generational talent, that second overall pick that he was a couple of years ago. I just don't want us to be in a situation where we come to um, having to pick or choose between Chase and and Montez next year, and we ultimately, like, lose out on possibly gaining some. And that's just my frustration with the team as a as a whole. I don't think we're a smart franchise or a smart team because I feel like we drafted Phil Mathis to fill Deron Payne's void. But guess what? Deron Payne, we, he went out and balled. We ended up giving him his, his money, and now we're stuck at a crossroads where we have to pick between Chase or, uh, or Montez. So, I don't know. I, I, it's just frustrating to see, you know, us back where we – don't necessarily want to be totally and by the way um i think that to add on to the contract side i do think someone could extend chase this offseason because burrow's eligible right yep which would mean that chase is also extension eligible this offseason so um he definitely is so like you could you could trade him and and have another team be like yeah no we'll sign him but if you're chase like the bidding starts at an average annual value of 18, 19 a year at least. Like, if I'm him, I'd probably just bet on myself. I'd probably say, like, hey, I'm going to come back, I'm going to be awesome, and I'm going to make 20 mil a year, and I'll test that on the open market. So, like, your point about the Washington side of it is correct. The The problem for kind of the bigger picture is, in many ways, the same conversation we've been having about Lamar. It's like, yeah, but what about the market? Like, it's, it's all dependent on who would actually do that. So from the Washington, like, long-term strategy uh, department, yeah, they are bad at it. They're very bad at it. And they have been very bad at it the entirety of Dan Snyder's ownership. 
um, and specifically the last decade when they foobarred the the Kirk thing. Uh, and if you don't know what foobar is, that's going to have to be one that you Google. Uh, they they foobarred the the Kirk thing to, into oblivion, where they could have had him for like eight nine million if they had extended him in like 2014. Uh, 2015, and then they could have had him for like 16, and then they could have had him for who knows, but certainly not crazy money. And then it was like, well, now he's thrown for 4,000 yards multiple years in a row and almost hit 5,000. So uh, you're probably gonna have to pay him a lot now. And he's got all the leverage because he's got you bent over two franchise tags. Like, good job, guys. <laughs> Bravo on that one. Then, like you said, when it comes to Terry, they kind of played themselves a little bit last year by waiting. And you saw other guys get contracts and, you know, they eventually they got it done, but could they have gotten it done for a million and a half less per year if they had been first instead of last? This year, they get it right with Duran in terms of that that part of the negotiation, for sure. I think the Duran deal was great. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree. Like, I think there's arguments to be made both ways. I kind of would argue that either is a good plan. Just stick with it. But it seemed like they had decided last year they were not going to extend Duran, which is why they spend a second round pick on on Mathis. Although that said, like Mathis is a good piece for them. Mm. Mathis is a good piece with Allen and Payne because they like to play that Cinco front. He can actually play nose. Duran really doesn't belong playing nose. He's a one or at his best, he's a three technique, which is John's position. So that like I would argue that yet while yes, Mathis was insurance in case Payne left you didn't have to move off of pain because you you drafted Mathis, but there is, on some level, a lack of cohesion in a plan where it's like, hey, man, you drafted the replacement, now just let the replacement happen. Uh, and instead, you 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 spend the big money on pain, and now you've got the second-round pick, and by the way, you've got John Ridgeway, and now you've still got decisions to make on, on sweat and pain. Eventually, they've got to go with the plan. I think it's smart to keep your options open as long as possible. They don't have to make a decision yet, but eventually you get to the point, and this is like the Wizards thing, right? Oh, we want to keep our options open. Keep our options open. Oh, crap, we should have traded Brad Beal two years ago. And that's that's the situation the commanders need to avoid is where they get so far down the path of keeping the options open that they just lose someone for nothing or they lock themselves into something that's that's silly and you actually shut the window on yourself as opposed to picking a plan and sticking to it. And I think that's pro- I think that's what you're what you're saying and and I would agree with that. Yeah, 100%. And I know we're sort of kind of up against a break, but if we had to choose, if you had to, you know, pick a Chase Young, if you had to pick a Montez Sweat, keep one and let one walk, which one would you As of today, I would pick Sweat and I would hold my breath and pray that I don't look like an idiot in 2 years. I don't think like if you're going to fail you fail with a guy like Montez Sweat, yeah. who you're going to fail high, if you will. Like, the floor is is underneath you. He's only going to be so bad, a.k.a. he's going to be real good. But the ceiling of Chase is is terrifying. But it also, I think the money difference is where I'd be like, I, I could take a gigantic swing, but if it hits on Chase, i got to pay him 23. Like, what are you paying Chase on? 23, 24, 25? Like, what's, what's an elite pass rusher going to be going for? As opposed to Sweat, who's an awesome player, borderline Pro Bowl player, who is not a hyper elite pass rusher, and thus you might be able to pay 18 a year. Yeah. So I think I think that's, or maybe even less, 16, 15 a year. So I think that the ability to sign someone else uh, and, and have like more depth and, and good players all around versus the one big shot at Chase Young probably the direction I'd lean but god I'd be I'd be scared it's not it in, in a way that's it's good options but it's also like one feels safe one feels high risk and when if you miss on the high risk one you're gonna feel real dumb yeah I, I feel like if we if we are to let Chase walk and I think this is just consistent with a lot of people that leave Washington they leave they go somewhere and they really flourish and I think Chase could be a similar That is definitely possible. All right, uh, quick hit of what's trending. Then when we get back, let you know which rule change proposals passed at the NFL owners' meetings. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.